All right. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Mr. Dean, and I have a special guest with us here today. Um, everyone, welcome Melissa Wells. Um, Melissa is a regional care coordinator with the Children's Advocacy Center of Georgia. Um, and a little known fact, I invited Melissa because Melissa and I go way back all the way into our undergraduate um, program. We graduated from the same program um, and have worked alongside each other in different roles throughout our entire careers. So, Melissa, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We are excited to hear from you and learn from you. And everybody, the reason I kind of have Melissa here is because um, she um, is another voice. So I know you guys get tired of hearing from me. Um, so she is another voice who graduated from a um, criminal justice program and went into varying aspects of um, child welfare, juvenile justice, um, all of that. So, Melissa, if you will, will you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, it's it's hard to know where to start because my journey was a little sporadic. So, um, I, I graduated uh, from high school back in 05. I'm going to tell my age here for a minute. And um, started college right out of high school, thinking that was what I was supposed to do, because that's what everybody told me to do. Um, and very quickly fell on my face and ended up taking a, a two-year break um, and not going back until 2009. And so when I started back, I, I really had no idea uh, what I wanted to do. Um, I had just a general uh, major and signed up for a bunch of different classes, just trying to figure things out and ended up in an intro to criminal justice course uh, with a professor that literally changed the course of my life. And since Adam's smiling because he knows exactly who I'm talking about. Um, his name was Tony Simons, and he very, very quickly became a mentor to me and to all of his students, I think. Um, and it was in that intro to criminal justice class that I, I figured out what I already knew, um, but also uh, just my direction. And at that point, I started focusing in on uh, victim services. My why has been the same for my entire career. Um, I don't know if you guys get asked what your why is, but we get asked all the time. Um, and mine has been consistently just to be a voice for the voiceless for children, for adults, for anyone in the criminal justice system that feels like they're not being heard and they're not being listened to. So I very quickly started focusing on uh, victim services when I was choosing my classes. I signed up for anything and everything I could um, just to learn more about uh, victimology and a victim's experience within the system and in doing that, I learned not only how it impacts uh, victims directly, but also how it impacts their families, how it impacts their, their lives uh, from that point forward. And so I went through uh, my undergrad. I graduated with my uh, bachelor's degree in criminal justice in 2013 um, and decided then that I didn't want to go to school anymore. <laughs> Um, I was uh, not a big fan of it. Uh, I was one of those people that was just in a hurry to work. Um, I wanted to be working in my field. Um, what I didn't realize is that uh, you do not save the world the day after you graduate from college. <laughs> Ooh, can, you repeat, can you repeat that? <laughs> You are not going to save the world the day after your college graduation. Um, you are probably not even going to have a job in your field yet. Um, but that is okay. No one told me that was okay. Um, so I'm, I'm telling you all now, that's okay. Um, I ended up babysitting and working in retail for about six months. Uh, just waiting to... Um, 
pull on the connections I'd already made in my community while doing undergrad work. So during my time in college, I did internships at our local child advocacy and sexual assault center. I really stuck myself out there and started connecting myself to people that I knew would be able to connect me to a job in the future. So I had to wait about six months, and then I finally got the call that I'd been waiting for, um, and there were two positions open at our local child advocacy and sexual assault center, one for a forensic interview, a forensic interviewer, and one for a victim advocate for children and families. I was the only person they interviewed that just wanted the forensic interviewer position. Um, and the reason for that was because I had actually uh, worked as, um, I don't even know if the AmeriCorps program still exists, but I had been an AmeriCorps VISTA, um, which was just a volunteer coordinator in early 2009, 2010. And I had worked very closely with the forensic interviewer at the Child Advocacy Center then and really was interested in learning more about her position. And so I stayed in contact with her, even though she did not stay employed there the entire time I was in college. I always managed to introduce myself to the person that was in that position um, because I had my eye on it, like I said, from 2009. And now, mind you, I didn't graduate till 2013. So I had ample opportunity to change my mind, change my path. Um, but that just that position was where I needed to be and I knew that. And so I was hired there in January of 2014 and I remained in that position as a forensic interviewer for seven and a half years. Um, and then for the last two years, I was also a sexual assault victim advocate. Awesome. So I'm going to kind of ask you um, to explain what a forensic interviewer is because um in victimology, we talk about um, kind of victim services and victim advocacy. Um, and then those of you who are watching this uh, for professional development, uh, you may not know that this position even exists in, in, in this realm. So, um, Melissa, will you take some time to kind of explain what exactly is a forensic interviewer? Well, a forensic interviewer, in short, is just someone that has conversations with children. That is the most brief way you can explain it to a lay person in the community. Uh, a lot of times when people heard what my title was, they thought that I worked for the FBI uh, or for GBI. Uh, you know, they, they hear forensics and they think uh, criminal minds or CSI or law and order, things like that. But the reason um, you have that forensic component is because forensic interviewing is science-based. It is constantly being researched. There are always new methods of forensic interviewing being developed because we're always learning new ways to talk to children. And so as a forensic interviewer, my job was to talk to children who were victims of child sexual and child physical abuse children who'd witnessed domestic violence or just horrific crimes. Um, a whole, the whole purpose of a forensic interviewer is to avoid having that child have to talk to law enforcement officers, um, court representatives, and also to avoid having them tell their story repeatedly. Uh, forensic interviews are always recorded they should always be conducted in a neutral, child-friendly environment, which in our state is the Child Advocacy and Sexual Assault Center. And so uh, don't feel bad if you don't know what a forensic interviewer is. There were people in our community, uh, people that I worked directly with for years, um, that when I was first introduced to them, still didn't understand what my job was and why it was important. Um, there are law enforcement officers who think being a forensic interviewer is as simple as attending a 10-hour training um, and then, you know, 
going out in the community and having conversations with kids. And it's just, it's much more complex than that. Um, I, when I was first hired as a forensic interviewer, my bachelor's degree was not enough. Um, I needed to have a specific um, forensic interviewing of children training. There are probably three or four that are state and nationally recognized, but the elite is um, the training that's completed at the National Children's Advocacy Center, which is in Huntsville, Alabama. And it's a 40-hour training course. Um, and on your second day, they sit you in front of a child and they tell you to introduce yourself and uh, build rapport with that child. Um, and it's the to this day, one of the scariest things I think I've ever done in my career um, was sitting in front of this precious little eight-year-old boy, and I will never forget, we talked about he had made chicken fettuccine with his mom the night before, and that was one of the things that we talked about in our short little conversation, but the amount of information you learn in those 40 hours of training is just phenomenal. I carry it with me in my career, in my day-to-day, -day, even now, uh, almost, you know, a little over 10 years in doing this. Um, and so that training is really what I built the rest of my career as a forensic interviewer on. Awesome. So you were a forensic interviewer for a very long time and, um, I believe that is where I first had interaction with you in the professional world um, outside of college. And Melissa was a great forensic interviewer. Um, so, Melissa, kind of take us, continue on your journey from forensic interviewing. So I, um, I like I said, I spent seven and a half years doing forensic interviews. Um, I, there was no place I was more comfortable than my forensic interview room, um, which sounds crazy because you're talking about things that are just unimaginably awful um, that these kids have experienced. And when you tell people what you do for a living, they look at you like you're insane. Um, how how do you listen to that every day? How do you go home at night? How do you sleep at night? How do you function? And I still can't explain it, but there is a part of my brain, uh, and you all will understand this, when you work in victim services, when you work with survivors, you're able to compartmentalize in a way that not everyone can because you do have to go home at night. You do have to have a life outside of your job. Um, and it is a balancing act. <laughs> so uh, for the first few years of my career, I thought that I needed to be all in 150%, uh, no social life, no nothing outside of my little forensic interviewer box. Um I worked with people that, how do I put this nicely? Um, I, well, at the time, it is, it's not, it is still kind of like this, but it's a little different now, I think. Um, at the time, it was a very male-dominated field. I was in a room more often than not uh, where I was the only woman, where I was the youngest, uh, and the most inexperienced. And so I very quickly had to become um, loud in the sense that when I had something to say that was important, I had to figure out a way to get people to listen. Um, I have what I call the gift of sarcasm and wit. Um, I can make uncomfortable conversations um, funny. And so I very quickly kind of honed in on that. And um, at first it was met with a lot of resistance. I remember uh, my first boss in the real world looking at me one day and saying, um, you're trying too hard. Just talk to these kids and go home. That's it. That's all I need you to do. Um, and that resonated with me a lot because I didn't want it to be just that. Um, but I also wanted to keep my job. <laughs> I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be fired. Um, I didn't want to make anyone upset. And so um, I went into this field 
thinking um, that I was going to save all the voiceless children that existed. And I very quickly realized that um, this was a game of chess, not checkers. And uh, a vast percentage of what we do is uh, political. You got to know the right people. You got to put your foot in the right doors. And um, I spent the first half of my career just proving to everyone that I deserved to be there. Um, and the way I did that was I just focused on training. I did every single web-based training I could that had to do with forensic interviewing. Um, I did a lot of training on recantations because that was something that we were talking a lot about in our community uh, at the time that I was working. Um, we had children who were being interviewed, and then a week or two later, they were telling everybody that they were telling they they weren't telling the truth. And so, I did a lot of training around that. And then I also started learning about um, our multidisciplinary team, which was just our entire community that worked together uh, on these types of cases. So not just myself, but law enforcement, prosecutors, DFACs, um, community mental health providers, your school social workers, um, representatives from juvenile court. Somehow everybody has to figure out how to come to the table and have a one conversation um, about these particular children and Putting all of these people in a room together is just a nightmare. So, oh. and I, Adam's I mean, been in those, that room can be a nightmare yeah. as well. So, Adam's been in those rooms before, and it is it is uncomfortable. And so, I, I will say that I think a a large portion of this type of career field, when you choose it your, yourself for yourself, is just knowing how to communicate with other people, um, knowing how to engage in conversation uh, without saying anything. Uh, I find myself um, participating in conversations just with my eyes sometimes. That eye contact, that engagement, um, these are things that I had to learn. <laughs> they weren't things that I just automatically knew. Um, but funnily enough, they're things that you're taught in your forensic interview training because the kids are looking for the same thing from you. They're looking for that engagement, that buy-in. That's whatever. That's what all the adults at the table are looking for too. Uh, so um, I worked uh, for the first, I think, two years of my career. We were just a child advocacy center, and then in 2016, uh, we added the sexual assault center component. So we became what the state of Georgia calls a dual center in the sense that we could provide services not only to children, but also to adults that had experienced sexual assault, domestic violence, um, and we really started uh, developing that portion of our program after that because um Providing services to adults is a little bit different than providing them to kids. However, one of the interesting things about the National Children's Advocacy Center forensic interview training is that you can use that same forensic interview structure to talk to an adult just as you can a child. And that was something that we really started trying to push with our law enforcement officers, bring us your adult victims of sexual assault. Call us as soon as you come into contact with them. Don't try to talk to them in the field. Let them come here. Let us have a conversation with them, a forensic interview, just like we would a child. And then we can connect them to an advocate, a victim advocate. And so that was also when um, I think officially it would have been 2019 was when we first rolled out our adult advocacy and forensic medical exam program. And that's when things just kind of exploded. <laughs> Fair enough. And every, if you are watching this for victimology, we will have the Teal House, um, who is our um, CAC and Sexual Assault Center here in Statesboro, um, presenting to us 
so you will become more familiar with our local resources as well. So, Melissa, when things kind of went and kind of blew up, um, <clears throat> you made a transition into child welfare. Um, and it was one that I was already in child welfare and I did not see coming. Um, I did not because being a victim advocate is so different than actually working with families and reunifying and things like that. And um, through my classes, when we talk about child welfare, I will talk with you all about how I think criminal justice relays into the child protective services realm of child welfare. But Melissa blew that out of the water and went into foster care um, and was a foster care case manager. So for the record, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, she did very well with it. But Melissa, kind of tell us about your experience transitioning into child welfare from victim services. So uh, throughout my time as a forensic interviewer and a victim advocate, I, I was the person that everyone knew as the, the person who did not enjoy defects. I, I didn't get it. I, I, I don't get um, uh, family preservation. I don't get uh, this re the reunification aspect of um, keeping children with people who hurt them. Um, none of it made sense in my brain um, as a forensic interviewer and a victim advocate. And as you guys learn more about those particular positions, that will make more sense because it just went against everything that I thought was Right. Uh, and so uh, you will find in your career that sometimes change happens, even if it's not what you're choosing, even if it's not what you're ready for. Um, and that's what happened to me. I did not choose to leave my career as a forensic interviewer and advocate, um, but I had to. And so at that point, I felt very uh, confused. I had no idea what I wanted to do next. I took a little bit of time off um, just uh, thinking about which direction I wanted to go in. And so something I knew uh, was that I wanted to stay in this direct services realm um, and Quite frankly, once you're a forensic interviewer, most people don't leave that position. So it's not like I could just jump over here and be a forensic interviewer somewhere else. No, that option wasn't on the table for me. And so I decide, decided to apply for a position with um, DFACS. And I thought it was an investigative position <laughs> until I am in the interview, neck deep in these awesome questions and just firing it out with the county director that I was talking to. And then I say, well, what position is this for? Always ask that at the beginning of your interview. Don't wait till the end, okay? Um, and he says, well, it's for foster care. Okay. Um, but at this point, I am an adult. I have bills. I, I need to work. I need to work. And this is what I know. Um, at least I'm not going into it completely blind. I've, I've got some experience under my belt. And maybe in my mind, I thought maybe this will help it make sense. Um, and it did help it make help. It did help me sort through a lot of things, um, a lot of misconceptions I had about uh, the state. Um, and so I was offered the position and I started working as a foster care case manager um, in 2021, I want to say, ish. Yeah, 2021. And um, it is the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, I 10 out of 10 do not recommend unless you know that that is absolutely your passion. And there are people, y'all, that work in this field as foster care case managers, and they are phenomenal at it and are just born to do it. 
I knew I was not one of those people very quickly. But again, I need to build my skill set. I need to work and pay my bills. <laughs> and so I started learning everything I possibly could. I remember I had a conversation with um, another fellow student uh, slash friend of mine that Adam and I graduated with that also worked for the same county that I had just been hired on uh, to work with. And she worked in investigations. And I just happened to run into her at a grocery store right when I finished my um weeks long training that the state has you do uh, before you can have your own caseload. And she asked me, she said, do you feel ready? And I said, absolutely not. Like, I think it's insane that you guys are just going to turn us loose and give me children to be in charge of. Um, that just kind of blew my mind. Um, and she said, you know, you're ready. You just don't realize it. You just have to jump in and, and go. And boy, that is what I did. Um, here's what they don't tell you when you're in training with defects to be a foster care case manager. You are that child's parent. No one will ever say that to you during training. Um, but I'm telling you are that child's parent. It is your responsibility to make sure they are enrolled in school, that they go to school, that they have health care that they go to medical appointments, that they are getting any type of visitation, phone calls, medications. I mean, I went to bed one night and woke up the next morning and had 17 children um, that I did not ask for. And then on top of that, I was also managing their parents, um, which anyone who knows me will tell you, I am not as good with adults as I am children. Um, and so it was a tornado, um, of just crazy, but I was able to still use these skills I developed early in my career uh, in this one. Again, conversation was key. Learning how to communicate with kids taught me how to communicate better with adults. And so now I was using all of that. Um, I was being blamed for things that I had nothing to do with, uh, which is literally the epitome of working in child welfare. It is your fault always every day, no matter how many times you try to explain that it's not. Um, and so uh, eventually after about, uh, I think it was about six months of carrying my own caseload, I became very interested in our high needs children uh, in the county that I was employed with. And when I say high needs kids, I mean the kids nobody else wants. The kids with extreme uh, trauma, mental health issues, um, excuse me, um, the kids who uh, no longer had parents, their parents had signed over their parental rights and they were just in the system until they turned 18. These were the kids that I wanted to work with. And so my caseload transitioned to a high needs caseload. Um, and then <laughs> I learned how to um, work all the back doors that no one tells you about uh, during that DFACS training they make you do for like 12 weeks. It's insane. Um, and so I, I found myself again being a voice for kids that no one else wanted to listen to. Uh, so when I told you earlier that my why remained the same, it, it really did unintentionally. I didn't go into working with DFACS thinking, oh, yeah, I want to work with all the kids no one else wants to work with. Sounds like a great idea, uh, but man, it's what I was good at. Uh, these kids, connecting with them on a level that no one else had before and just trying to understand their needs versus their wants and then also helping them understand the difference. Um, I had a smaller caseload than most foster care case managers because of that, so I was fortunate in that aspect. Um, also got some experience working in investigations, uh, which again is not for the faint of heart. 
going into people's homes, telling them what they're doing wrong, um, and being the enemy the minute you knock on the door is scary. Um, I feel like I'm making it sound really, really awful. So for those of you that want to work in child welfare, I apologize. <laughs> you are good. So let me ask you this. <clears throat> I say a lot of times that our criminal justice program prepared us to be better suited in child welfare in the fact that we understand the court system. We understand um, kind of how to go about things in the court systems, because ultimately in child welfare, the court is the overall boss, as you would say, and they run our every move. Um, but also you touched on you had that uh, time with investigations and you did on call and things like that. Um do you think that I always say that it's like being Elliot Stabler or Olivia Benson without the badge, um, being an investigator? Would you agree with me or disagree with me? No, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, because again, another aspect of working in child welfare that you don't learn in your training is that when you go to these court hearings, you are where all the information is coming from. The judge is not looking at these parents yet. They're not looking at the kids for information. They're looking at you. They're looking at your reports. They're looking at your documentation. If you don't document it, it didn't happen. Period. I said that so many times to Melissa. <laughs> Period. Okay. And I ca that is another aspect of my career that I've carried into my next position. If you don't document it, it did not happen. And the reason that they hammer that into you so much is because that documentation is what your judge is looking at. It's what your attorney that represents the department is looking at. And you're the person standing up in front of the courtroom answering the questions. They're talking to you before they're talking to anyone else. And so, when you're going into these homes, when you work investigations, even as a foster care case manager, when you're doing your monthly visits, you have to not only be aware of your surroundings, but just noticing any changes, the smallest thing, changes in behavior with your parents, changes in location. I had parents that would never meet me in the same place every month, and it drove me nuts. Because I need to see where you live. I need to see your home. And some of them, some people just don't have one. They don't. And that's how they've lived their entire lives. Just jumping from place to place. And if that's all you've got to work with in child welfare, you need to spend that in a way that it benefits that parent and that child and their relationship. And then you need to be able to explain it to a judge. And you need to help that judge see what you saw. Um, I learned very quickly, and this is something I already knew, but it really put it into perspective for me. Uh, most people don't grow up the way that I did. Um, and again, it's something you know going into this field. You're going to come in contact with all walks of life. But having to help a judge understand why this mom that's working two jobs, one of them being door dashing, even though she doesn't have her own vehicle, um, living in a trailer that uh, is roach infested, but we have put down traps, we have pest control, we have air conditioning units that she didn't have two months before. I've got to spin this in a way to where the judge understands that this, this mama is doing the best that she can for herself so she can get her babies back. And that is when Adam, when he, when you say that we are the Olivia Bensons, that's what I think about um, going into these environments that are scary and that no one else wants to go into and just using your senses to make sure that 
if these babies go back home, they're going to be safe. Safe looks different for every single family that you work with. There is no universal definition of what safety looks like. Um, other than the fact that I don't want this kid to be placed in direct harm. Now, if they're in a roach infested trailer with their mama who works two jobs, keeping the lights on, making sure that that whole place stays together, they can still be safe. And that was difficult for me to wrap my brain around because <laughs> it's not how I grew up. Um, I don't think that's how most of us grew up. Um, but it is just, it really, really puts things into perspective for you. Now I'm thinking about that mama because it's, it's figurative, but also it was kind of similar to what happened. Um, but yeah, and it, it's, I think that our undergrad work, I took a lot of, um, court related courses. So like criminal procedure, learning, um, how the law works, even though I'm not going to be an attorney, um, because I'm going to have to explain that not just to these parents I'm working with, but also these kids. These kids have to be present for their hearings when you work in child welfare. They deserve to know what's happening. Um, and so being able to explain to an eight-year-old why they're having a hearing, why mom and dad are there, but they don't get to go home with mom and dad after is, again, a skill set that you're going to develop as you learn about the criminal justice system um, and about court hearings. Awesome. So, Melissa, take us from child welfare to where you are currently, because you transitioned back into victim services. And, and so um, DFAX was never a permanent home for me. I told people that from literally the day that I started. I was very honest about it with our county director. I don't plan on being here the rest of my life. Thank you for the opportunity. I will give you 100% while I am here. Um, and so back when I was still working as a forensic interviewer, um, the Child Advocacy Centers of Georgia became um, the statewide recognized, um, I'm trying to figure out how to explain it. So they got the official state contract. Correct. And so in 2019, they became um, officially in charge of all things commercial sexual exploitation uh, when it came to children. And so uh, when the human trafficking uh, commercial sexual exploitation hotline went live in October 2020, I think, it was under the Child Advocacy Centers of Georgia. And so I'd had just a little bit of training on, uh, we refer to it as CSEC, which just stands for Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. I'd had a little bit of training on um, how they were going to do assessments for referrals. I knew about the hotline um, and I had the opportunity to kind of just sit back and watch it develop as I moved throughout my career um, and into child welfare. And then um, I was made aware of a position that opened up. Uh, they call it a PRM position. And the reason they call it that is because I have the ability as a regional care coordinator, that's PRN, to work with any youth anywhere in the state of Georgia. And so that's unique in the sense that our other care coordinators are assigned to specific regions. We have one in the north, the east, the west, the south. I can go anywhere at any time. Um, and that was interesting to me because I have, again, the gift of sarcasm and wit. So I'm able to uh, insert myself into just about any multidisciplinary team you can think of. Um, and hit the ground running. And so I found out about the position um, late. I think it was, oh my gosh, I'm losing track of time. And that, like, it was December 2022, I think. Yeah. Um, sent in my resume. Uh, it took 
two and a half months for them to go through the hiring process and hire me on. Um, and it, I went from working in the field all the time, being on call all the time, to working a remote position based out of my home that was um, in the victim services field, but not direct service. So what I do as a regional care coordinator is I get these referrals for children that have been identified as possible victims of commercial sexual exploitation. And so I start what we call um, our assessment process. And I go through our assessment process with the person that sends in the referral, which is normally DFACS, law enforcement, an employee at one of our CACs. Sometimes it's a parent or a community member, but nine times out of 10, it's someone in that multidisciplinary team. We go through that assessment process with them. We make sure that child is scheduled for a forensic interview that they've had a forensic medical exam if they need it. Sometimes we are working with children who've been pulled directly off the street by one of our uh, human trafficking task forces with GBI or FBI. Sometimes we're working with children who have been on runaway, who are in the child welfare system. They're foster care kids. They've been on runaway from anywhere from two months to six months to a year or more. And they've recently been recovered and that case manager has suspicions that they've been exploited. And so we make sure that that child is connected to any service they could possibly need. Um, our child advocacy and sexual assault centers are the biggest piece of that puzzle. They are the hub for your forensic interview, for your medical exam, for your mental health services advocacy and so we really depend on them to follow up with these connections that we're making as care coordinators and um, it was a, it's a much slower pace than what I was used to <laughs> um I had many conversations with my supervisor in the first couple months um where we'd be doing a staffing and she'd say you know do you have is there anything else you need and I would ask her for more work please give me more things to do I don't know what to do with my hands um and when you work in this field anyone will tell you when you go from that fast pace on call constantly mindset to one like this, it is life changing. <laughs> um, I um, feel like I'm in a point in my career where I am just finally getting to enjoy it. And y'all, I've been doing this for over a decade. Um, but I'm really starting to feel like my skill set is helpful and beneficial to the children and families that I work with. Um, but at the end of the day, I can also breathe. Um, but you put in a lot of work before you get to this point. It is it is not easy by any means. Um, but anywho, it's beside the point. So I'm actually about to transition into a new position with this team. Um, I'm actually going to be our hotline coordinator which means I'm going to be in charge of our statewide hotline and supervising all of our hotline advocates and our interns. So uh, I am just very fortunate to be part of a team um, where I can advance like that and where those opportunities exist. Um, but again, it took some work to get here. <laughs> awesome. So I have just a couple of questions to wrap up. Um, you talked a little bit about your why, and my professional development students will understand this because um, that was the first question that was posed in the first lecture um, was why you are here. And so in my career, my why changed a little bit as far as my focus and, and things like that. Um, but yours has consistently stayed and 
yours has been a focal point. Um, do, how do you stay motivated? Um, like, how does that why help you stay motivated? Oh, man. So um, I think I'm a little different than most people in the sense that what motivates me is I, 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 I think about all the times that I wasn't able to speak up for the kids that I should have been able to speak up for. And it, it wasn't always my fault. Uh, it may have just been that I didn't have the opportunity. It may have just been that I wasn't in front of the right people. But I, I think about that. And then the funny thing about being in this field for as long as Adam and I have been is you tend to work when you work in the same area, you tend to hear about the same families. And so for the first seven and a half years that I worked at the advocacy center, I saw what happened when we didn't have the appropriate advocacy for that child or that family. Um, there were many times that I interviewed children who were victims of sexual abuse. And then a year, two, three years down the road, uh, they were placed back in front of me as perpetrators. Uh, there were many times when I had parents in front of me as a, as a victim advocate who had experienced sexual assault or domestic violence or physical abuse. Um, and they didn't follow through with any type of mental health service, didn't follow through with advocacy. And I would later hear about how they were now in jail, in prison, um, or dead. Some of them did eventually commit suicide or uh, used illegal substances and um, lost their lives that way. And so when I get frustrated, when I get bogged down, um, when I get burnt out, which is a term you will hear constantly in this work, and it looks different for everyone. Don't let anybody tell you that burnout looks the same for everybody. It does not. When I get burnt out, when I get tired, I think about those moments. Um, and I remember the result of me not using the resources available to me and my team and what that looked like for that child or that parent. Now, what's funny is I've never, I've never looked at a, a position I've gone into or that I've thought about going into and, and thought to myself, oh, does this line up with my why? Does this make sense? You know, um, but life happened that way. And I, I'm not telling you that that's how it's going to work for you or for anybody else. But I honestly believe that the people who enter into this career field are just made differently than other people. You're going to be doing things that no one else really understands or can make sense of or can imagine themselves doing. Um, and so when I say that my why stayed the same, it that is true, but it also kind of, I went into this as just being a voice for children, and then it became being a voice for children and their families, being a voice for children, their families, and adult survivors, um, and it all just encompassed the same goal, which is just literally just to use my words as their words because they're not in these meetings that we have constantly with our multidisciplinary team. They're not in all of these court hearings um, that we're having, even in, in or outside the child welfare system. Your people aren't always going to be there with you to speak for themselves. It's your job to speak for them. Thank you. If that makes sense. It does. So kind of to wrap up, um, <clears throat> for both victimology and professional development, in professional development, we've talked about secondary traumatic stress and vicarious trauma. Um, in victimology, we are talking about victim services and kind of how traumatic some of that can be. 
So we've talked about the importance of self-care and kind of you've mentioned a little bit about self-care. Um, I, I want to kind of conclude with what advice do you have for students who are going to be entering this field, whether it be criminal justice, victim services, um, child welfare, whatever, how, what advice do you have for them in terms of the importance of self-care and getting through vicarious trauma? Gosh, you're going to roll your eyes a million times over because you will literally this like self-care and the importance of acknowledging burnout is going to be hammered into your brain to the point that it just feels annoying. So what I figured out early, well, later on in my career is that sometimes um, burnout for me again I think I said this earlier it doesn't look like it does for everyone else stress the way I manage stress is going to be different from the way you manage stress there is no universal picture of what overworking yourself looks like so I know some people who when they experience burnout the way they refocus is just by completely disconnecting their phone is off, their computer is off, they need to go on a vacation and not speak to anyone for the next 14 days. I'm not like that. When I'm overwhelmed, when I'm stressed, when I'm burnt out, um, you're probably going to find me listening to my most favorite or latest favorite murder podcast. Um, I'm going to decompress by watching my favorite Criminal Minds episodes because Shamar Moore. Um, I am, you know, I may, I may find a new murder mystery book to read. Uh, crime is how I decompress. I don't know why, but that's just how my brain looks. So it, any, it, the best piece of advice I could give anybody in this field is do what works for you. Take everyone else's advice with a grain of salt. And if someone is trying to back you into a corner and convince you that you're burnout because they think that your burnout looks like their burnout, no. Um, use your words <laughs> and explain to them that, you know, I appreciate your concern, but right now I'm actually stressed because of this. I'm not burnt out. So I had to learn very quickly how to kindly and professionally explain to people that burnout for me, um, I just completely shut down. I stopped doing my work. I don't want to do it anymore because I can't get my brain to chill out. That's what burnout looks like for me. You have to learn what it looks like for you first. And the only way to do that is to just kind of jump in this field and go. You'll learn that as students because you get burnt out by the end of the semester. You're tired. Everything's due at once. My God, it works the same way in real life. Okay. Everything's due at the end of the month. Your stress level is going to increase. You have to learn how to manage that in your own way. So that's the best piece of advice I can have. Don't let somebody else push their their stress management methods on you. Learn your own. So, well, Melissa, thank you so much. Um, this hour has gone by very quickly. So yes, it has. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to kind of talk to us and imparting your wisdom. Just you've had so many awesome opportunities in this system that people may not think about, especially in victim services. Um, so I just, I appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate you guys having me. Uh, it's, it's still weird for me to see myself as a professional in the field. I think Adam can agree with me. Um, we're sitting here talking about things that I feel like we were just learning about yesterday. Um, but now it really is just life experience. So it just, it goes by quickly. Um, I hope you guys as students have uh, good experiences like Adam and I did, because they really mold you and get you ready for your career. Awesome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. All right, everyone. Have a great day.